When somebody knowingly and willfully conceals information from the public, um, and they do that because they think that it might change how the public exercises their constitutional right to cast a vote for the person who is going to represent them, you know, that's really serious. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Lawyer to Lawyer, with J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi, bringing you the latest legal news and observations with the leading experts in the legal profession. You're listening to Legal Talk Network. Welcome to Lawyer to Lawyer on the Legal Talk Network. I'm Craig Williams coming to you from sunny Southern California. I write a legal blog named May It Please the Court and have out two books called How to Get Sued, as well as a Christmas book called The Sled. And of special note, today we are celebrating our 500th podcast episode. While we're open to challenge, we believe this to be the longest continuously running legal podcast. So it's quite a milestone, and thanks to our listeners, we've gotten this far. Well, before we introduce today's topic, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Clio. Clio's cloud-based practice management software makes it easy to manage your law firm from intake to invoice. You can try it for free at Clio.com. That's C-L-I-O dot com. Well, campaign finance law in the United States can be very complicated. In the news and under our current administration, we've heard the terms campaign finance violations, hush money payments, private versus campaign payouts. Since 2010, the Supreme Court decision in Citizens United versus FCC and the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals decision in SpeechNow.org versus the FEC, campaign finance law has changed drastically. So how have these two decisions impacted our campaign finance laws? What actually constitutes a campaign violation? And is the current administration potentially guilty of this act? Today on Lawyer to Lawyer, we're going to discuss what constitutes campaign finance violations, these private versus campaign payouts, and take a look inside campaign and election law in the current political climate. Here to discuss today's topic is Erin Klopak. She is the Senior Legal Counsel of Campaign Finance for the Campaign Legal Center. Erin joined CLC in August 2008 after spending nearly a decade working on a wide range of campaign finance issues in the Federal Election Commission's Office of the General Counsel. Her areas of focus include the CLC's appellate and district court litigation and its federal reform and state and local reform programs. Well, welcome to the show, Erin. Thanks, Craig. I am really glad to be here. And one quick correction, I actually joined CLC in August of this year. I greatly appreciate the uh, extra 10 years of experience you tried to give me, but <laughs> uh, alas. Well, I'm sure you're knowledgeable enough, so let's just dive right in here and ask you that question. What What is uh, essentially a campaign finance violation these days? Sure. Well, so campaign finance law um, in general are the rules governing the raising and spending of money to help candidates get elected to political office. And their primary areas that campaign finance law involves are disclosure requirements, that the spending to influence elections be publicly disclosed so voters know who is spending money to influence their votes, who is providing financial support to candidates. Limits on how much people can give directly to candidates, which are called contributions. Um, That includes loans and in-kind contributions of goods or services. And then prohibitions on certain sources of spending. So we've heard a lot in the news about foreign nationals, um, corporations. You know, Citizens United, as you mentioned, um, changed the rules dramatically by allowing corporations to make unlimited um, independent expenditures um, in political campaigns, but they can, corporations remain prohibited from giving contributions directly to candidates. Well, how do PACs fit into it? Is there a, is, are PACs basically a workaround? Uh, well, so political committees or PACs are group associations of people that are permitted to uh, make contributions to candidates. There's restrictions on um, how much people can give to political committees that make contributions to candidates. After Citizens United and the other case that you mentioned, the Speech Now case and some other um, decisions by the SEC, the Federal Election Commission, relying on those decisions, there are now a category of PACs commonly known as super PACs 
that don't make direct contributions to candidates, and those entities can spend unlimited amounts of money on campaigns, independent of candidates. So they can run ads to support or oppose candidates, but they can't coordinate with candidates on that spending. Is that a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, we can't coordinate? Yeah, well, I mean, that's a great question. And this is one of the real problems that we're seeing today is that the premise of the Citizens United decision was that independent spending that's not coordinated with candidates um, as a matter of law cannot corrupt. But that assumption is that 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 spending is actually, in fact, um, independent. And I think we see a lot today and since Citizens United of spending that, you know, while there's no um, explicit agreement between a candidate and the people spending the money that candidates know who's spending money to help them. Um, and in, in fact, there have been instances of, of committees, you know, making public resources that are campaigns making public resources that committees can then use to, you know, quote unquote, independently engage in activities that help them out. Well, let's, let's kind of zone in here pretty quickly on, on one of the things we're going to be talking about today, Michael Cohen. Um, are we still in the, in the area of private versus campaign payouts when we're talking about him? No. I think the, the recent court filings, both regarding the uh, Michael Cohen's plea and the non-prosecution agreement entered into um, with, that AMI, uh, American Media, entered into, make quite clear that these were not just um, private payouts. So Michael Cohen, um, in, his, in pleading guilty, um, said that he made the uh, he spent the money to uh, pay Stormy Daniels not to um, publicize the alleged extramarital affair that she had with Trump in coordination and at the direction of Trump himself, and that the purpose of those payments was to influence the 2016 presidential election. AMI has similarly stated that um, it spent money, that it paid $150,000 to a different person who was making similar allegations, and that it made those payments also for the purpose of influencing the election. I think the AMI statement is particularly notable because uh, media entities like the National Enquirer um, generally have a lot of leeway to, they're largely exempt from campaign finance laws um, under an immediate exception that allows legitimate press activities such as publishing articles to um, be done without being subject to the reporting requirements and other requirements of campaign finance laws. Um, But at the same time, corporations are prohibited, as I mentioned earlier, from making contributions to candidates. So AMI's admission that the um, money that it spends in its decision to what they call catch and kill or purchase Ms. McDougal's story and then not publish it, um, that, the per- that the purpose of all of that activity was to influence the federal election is really significant and telling. Well, so here's the $64,000 question, or perhaps in today's parlance, the million-dollar question. If AMI was in the room and they've pled guilty and Cohen was in the room and he's pled guilty and Trump was in the room, where does that leave us? Right. No, I mean, that's, that's a really great question. And, and, you know, so there certainly seems to be mounting evidence that Trump was involved and in, directly involved in these payments, you know, and his story has been evolving since he was first asked about them back, I think, in April of 2018 and claimed he had no knowledge of them. But, you know, between his, the inconsistency of his statements and these direct admissions by both Cohen and AMI suggesting that Trump was, that the payments were made in coordination with him or at his direction in the case of Cohen, there seems to be quite compelling evidence. Um, and we don't know what other evidence the uh, prosecutors may have suggesting that Trump was indeed involved. So, you know, that raises the question whether there may be criminal liability for him. Now, you know, the Department of Justice has a policy that they've had for years against prosecuting a sitting president during that president's term in office. Um, It's not far from clear whether that policy ever contemplated um, alleged crimes that would allow, that had allowed the president to get elected into office in the first place. But um, even if that policy remains in effect, there's still the possibility of impeachment. And there's also the possibility 
of an indictment when um, Trump is no longer in office. And what do we learn from history? I mean, certainly we've gone through this before, uh, probably most notably with Nixon. Exactly. I mean, the Nixon obviously uh, resigned before he could be impeached. So, and and actually, Nixon, the the entire Watergate scandal is what led to the the Federal Election Campaign Act and the laws that we have now. They didn't exist at the time, but uh, you know, uh, interesting. Um, fact is that actually Nixon's personal lawyer went to prison for paying hush money to burglars um, during the 1972 campaign to keep them quiet, and he ended up serving prison time. And we know, obviously, you know, this ended Nixon's presidency. Right, but that brings us then to what Trump has been saying. One of his defenses is, well, if my lawyer paid it, then it's his, his wrong, not mine. Right. And there's, I mean, there's nothing to suggest that the fact that a lawyer was involved in the activity exonerates the candidate um, or, or the official um, who participated in it. It's certainly possible that Cohen violated the law and Trump did too, particularly if, as Cohen has alleged, um, he was acting at Trump's instructions. A gun is a gun is a gun. Right. Exactly. Well, can you give us a little bit of background on uh, the involvement of foreign nationals and foreign governments in our election process? I mean, not only do we have these hush money payments that we've been talking about, we also have obvious involvement of the Russian government. Uh, and if you, you know, just even remember listening to the debates, the timing of Trump's statements about the email disclosures from Hillary Clinton and then what the information that we have now about the WikiLeaks disclosures and the Russian hacking that got, you know, this all seems to be woven into a pretty tight web. Yes, no, absolutely. And that, I mean, that. so as I mentioned, I think at the beginning that there are several different areas of campaign finance law that are implicated here, you know, separate from the restrictions on contributions and the ban on corporations, um, one of the broadest bans or rules in campaign finance law is a prohibition on foreign nationals being involved in American elections. Um, And the foreign national ban is not just for contributions, it's for spending money independent of candidates, and it applies both to federal and state elections. And actually, a few years ago in 2012, there was a decision involving the question about whether the uh, restrictions on foreign national participation in American elections is constitutional. And um, then Judge Kavanaugh authored an opinion emphasizing that the government can bar foreign citizens from participating in the campaign process that seeks to influence how voters cast their ballots in American elections. And the Supreme Court affirmed that decision. But in the environment today, we have a number of different issues raising um, questions about to what extent Russia was involved in our election. So, um, you know, there's the question about the WikiLeaks information, um, you know, the meeting that happened at Trump Tower, where it appears that um, Donald Trump's son was seeking political opposition research on Hillary Clinton for the benefit of the Trump's campaign. That would certainly, you know, soliciting that information itself would violate the ban on contributions or expenditures by foreign nationals. We don't know what, if anything, the um, prosecutors are doing about that information at this point. Just yesterday, there was the Flynn sentencing hearing where um, you know, the judge expressed extreme concerns about the conduct um, that Michael Flynn had. became very obvious it was not what, his, what uh, Flynn's lawyers were expecting yesterday. Right. No, I, I think a, a lot of people were very surprised. There was a lot of speculation that um, you know, maybe the judge would go easy on him and be concerned about allegations that he or his lawyers had made about the FBI not informing him that uh, it would be a crime to lie to them. But in fact, the judge suggested that he might not be prepared to defer to the um, recommendation of prosecutors not to sentence uh, Flynn to any prison time. Um, We have the Maria Butina plea, Cohen himself and his plea. 
also. Do you think that the, when Flynn was sentenced, or it was when a sentencing hearing came up, do you think that the uh, kind of undercurrent, unspoken legal maxim of live by the sword, die by the sword came into play for uh, Flynn's claims to lock up Hillary Clinton? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's certainly ironic going back to to watch the the videos of him saying that. And, and I mean, similar similar statements by uh, Michael Cohen as well. So, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, before we move on to our next segment, we're going to take a quick break to hear a message from our sponsor. We'll be right back. Imagine what you could do with an extra eight hours per week. That's how much time legal professionals save with Clio, the world's leading practice management software. With intuitive time tracking, billing, and matter management, Clio streamlines everything you do to run your practice from intake to invoice. Try Clio for free and get a 10% discount for your first six months when you sign up at their website, clio.com, that's C-L-I-O.com, with the code L2L10, that's L2L, the number 10. And welcome back to Lawyer to Lawyer. I'm Craig Williams, and we are joined by Erin Klopak. She is the Senior Legal Counsel of Campaign Finance for the Campaign Legal Center. And just before the break, we were discussing what constitutes campaign finance violations, private versus campaign payouts, and, and especially foreign involvement. And just to follow up on our that portion of our conversation, how do you see uh, Trump and Michael Cohen uh, differing from John Edwards. I mean, we have very similar circumstances here. Right. So actually, it's interesting. I mean, Cohen and, or excuse me, Trump, and I think Rudy Giuliani have suggested that the Edwards case proves that there really can't be criminal liability here. And I think actually the Edwards case um, is really unhelpful to to this particular case. In the Edwards case, also, he he was tried um, ultimately, a jury was not um, able to agree on uh, most of the charges and, and rejected one of the charges. But most importantly, I think about that case was that the judge rejected arguments that Edwards had made that the payments couldn't be campaign contributions because they were not made exclusively to further his campaign. What the judge said was that a payment to a candidate's extramarital sexual partner is a campaign contribution if one of the reasons the payment is made is to influence the election. And here there is seems to be um, substantially more and, and stronger evidence that the payments that were made to the two women alleging affairs with Trump were done because of um, attempts to influence the election. Now, first of all, as we just talked about, uh, you have two people who made the payments can, admitting that the purpose of the payments were to influence the election. We certainly didn't have anything like that um, in the Edwards case. And you, you have those same people implicating Trump himself in the decision to make the payments. And then the timing of the payments here is is really significant. So with Stormy Daniels, I think that um, – you know, there's reporting that she, back in 2011, had been talking about her story, and there was some indication that it um, that it might be reported in a magazine. And I think Michael Cohen made threats to the ma- legal threats to the magazine about suing suing it if um, if the story were printed. But that would have been an opportunity. I think it was much closer right after the birth of uh, Trump's son. That certainly would have been a time that you would expect to see. Um, a payment made if it were being made for personal reasons. And instead, the payment wasn't made until, you know, weeks before the presidential election when, when Daniels was threatening to come public with uh, this information. And, you know, similarly with the AMI payment, which is also made, I think, like 12 days before the presidential election. So the timing of those payments um, so close to the election is is a real strong indication that they were made or corroboration of the statements by Cohen and AMI that they were made um, to influence the election. Is this almost a, a Streisand effect? I mean, from the standpoint that, you know, Barbara Streisand's home was not really known where it was until it became, she had complained to Google about it being available on the, on uh, Google Maps, and then it became, you know, viral of where it was located. I mean, are, are we in the, the same kind of situation here where if Trump had just not said anything and not been forced to disclose? And, and maybe the question is, why is it that, why do we have disclosure laws? What is it that's so important about disclosures? I mean, would would these disclosures have changed public votes? Well, you know, that's a really 
important question, and you know, I, I don't have the information to answer that. It's hard to know what would have happened, but um, certainly it seems that uh, AMI and and Cohen and, and maybe Trump himself and, and Trump himself um, were under the impression that that might be the case. And given how close the election was, you know, that's a real possibility. And I think it really underscores the importance of disclosure laws. Um, this is so fundamental to our democracy. This is how you know people make decisions about who they want to vote for. And disclosure helps them be able to assess who those candidates are, who, who supports them, um, and, and really evaluate candidates. And so when you have a candidate running for office that's hiding, you know, taking steps actively to conceal information that people may, you know, consider and, and that may affect the way people decide how to cast their vote, their votes. Well, if it was important enough to make the payment, it was probably important enough to affect votes. Oh, absolutely. So let's kind of follow the slippery slope here. You know, obviously AMI is, is uh, pleading guilty. Cohen has pled guilty and is uh, sentenced to three years for felony campaign violations. It's felony is certainly more serious than a misdemeanor. But how is this, uh, how does a penalty for a sitting president, is it impeachable? Do we have, do we have high crimes and misdemeanors here? Right. So that's a great question. And I wish I could say I knew the answer to that. Um, we don't have a great deal of precedent on you know, what exactly that means. Only three presidents in history have been subject to impeachment proceedings, um, but no president has ever been removed from office through impeachment. It's really up to Congress to decide whether this is an impeachable def- offense. And it's a complicated and uh, difficult process. I'm no expert on impeachment, but I do know that, um, you know, the House would vote first and would require a majority, uh, they would vote on articles of impeachment and would require a majority to impeach the president, which is kind of like a congressional indictment. Um, But then after that, the Senate would hold a trial and you would need at least two thirds of the Senate to find the president guilty and have him removed from office. Um, You know, that was the stage at which Clinton was not removed because there, I think there were 45 votes short of the 67 required. And, you know, you've seen, I think, in the the past days, various members of Congress being asked about, um, you know, their concerns about Cohen's plea. And, you know, a number of members have sort of dismissed this as, you know, oh, if every, if we prosecuted every campaign finance violation, then everyone would be going to prison, um, which is, you know, really disheartening. How true is that? It's just not true at all. How, how common are campaign violations? So, I mean, it is true that run-of-the-mill um, civil violations where a campaign um, fails to report uh, you know, spending or contributions by a deadline or, um, you know, inadvertently misstates uh, the totals um, or, you know, fails to refund excessive contributions by the required deadline. Those are sort of, those are not uncommon. Um, They're usually remedied by campaigns. Sometimes they pay a fine. Sometimes they pay a substantial fine. Um, But, you know, those are dramatically different than what we're talking about here, where steps are taken um, knowingly and willfully. That's the term of art to um, make a, to even bring a violation into the realm of criminal liability. Um, but when, when somebody knowingly and willfully conceals information from the public, um, and they do that because they think that it might change how the public exercises their constitutional right to cast a vote for the person who is going to represent them, um, you know, that's that's really serious. It's completely undermining the entire way that our democratic process is supposed to work. And, you know, that's a big deal. Does it come to the level of fraud? And And since we're going to talk about that, what's the remedy? I mean, impeachment is certainly a remedy, but if it was a fraud and if there was Russian involvement and there was a direct intention to hide these affairs that, you know, presumably a significant number of Americans would have voted against someone in that situation as they have historically in the past, do we have a do-over? I mean, what, we have no precedent for this, but what, what, it's what's being discussed is the potential for how do you unwind a presidency that was obtained this way, if in fact it was? 
as you say, there's no precedent. Um, I mean, under the way the impeachment proceeding would work, if um, a president is removed from office, then the vice president becomes, you know, would, would take over. Same thing would happen, I think, if um, Article if the 25th Amendment were invoked. so But is there any less involvement in the vice president's camp than there is in the president since they run on the same ticket together? I mean, would you, is there an argument that both the vice president and the president should be impeached at the same time for these violations? I haven't seen any allegations about um, the vice president having participated in any of the, all of these alleged wrongdoing. So, you know, I mean, I guess there's a taint in the if, if there is a taint in the campaign on the president's side, does that taint also affect the vice president's uh, campaign? I, I completely take your point about, you know, it, it certainly undermines confidence in the entire process. I mean, I think the real solution is to make sure that this doesn't happen again in the future. Um, and, you know, there will be another election in two years and, you know, people can <laughs> can exercise their votes in light of all of the information they have at that point. I mean, I think what this entire discussion and this entire um, situation really does underscore is why campaign finance laws are so important, contrary to, you know, the sort of efforts to dismiss them as not very meaningful and the need for stronger disclosure laws than we currently have and for stronger civil enforcement than we currently have. I mean, we're really at a um, a situation of great concern now where large amounts of money are being spent on our elections, and much of that money is going undisclosed. Are we approaching anything near RICO? I mean, we have a situation where the Trump Foundation has just agreed to dissolve itself after what is a, identified in the, in the charging documents is a significant problem. Uh, and then you have this situation potentially, if that turns out to be true, which we don't yet know. And is there a pattern here? Uh, you know, that's a great question. It's a, a question for the prosecutors who have all of that information. But it's certainly concerning the the number of uh, pending investigations that seem to implicate president. And guilty pleas that already exist. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And yeah, so no, as I was saying, I mean, I think we really need to improve our existing campaign finance laws. And, um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier about Citizens United and the the consequence of that case was to really just unleash vast amounts of corporate spending on elections. But the laws that we currently have were really designed for a different time and a different system in which there wasn't corporate spending on election and on elections in which much of that spending, you know, was not happening on the internet. And so we now have these big loopholes in campaign finance law that make it easier for Russia to spend money and to influence how people vote and and to do so in a way that totally conceals that information from the public. Were we really aware that that social media had such an influence? I mean, prior to the election, did were people that cognizant of the political effect of Facebook and Instagram and all these other social platforms that are out there? No, I don't think so. And the way that our laws work right now um, and, and the FEC's enforcement makes it really easy, not only for foreign entities and, and individuals, but also for domestic groups and people that want to hide their identity to, to use social media and the internet to spend money and try to influence voters and to just, you know, make sure they do it without explicitly saying vote for or against this person and they can hide who they are. Um, And so people don't know who is talking to them and it's deceitful um, and it should be fixed. And let's jump on that point. You said it's deceitful. Let's, you know, we've heard Trump complain about fake news. We've seen a lot of fact check uh, by the networks of uh, and news stations of Trump's statements, and there's a whole seemingly late night industry uh, that delves into it as well on both sides. So, do the campaign finance laws have an element or requirement of truth, and then how do we arbitrate that? Yeah, no, that that that's a good question too, and I think you know that's an issue that has actually been litigated um, in the Supreme Court, and because of our First Amendment freedom of speech, you know, the court has has held fairly clearly that you cannot um, legislate 
the tr truthfulness requirements in, in the context of politics. So they can't, the government cannot mandate that statements be true. And one of the big concerns is that with that is, you know, who evaluates whether a political statement is true or not. But I think what that really underscores is like why disclosure is so important because it's left to the people to evaluate the statements that are being served to them. And, you know, one of the most important ways to do that is to be able to know who is speaking and who is the person or group advocating um, a particular position and knowing that it's not just Americans for America, uh, excuse me, Americans for a better America, but that, that that group is actually, you know, such and such individual who spent $5 million on, you know, whatever ad about this particular issue. And you can really assess the bias and what personal or private interest that group or organization may have when they're spending that money and trying to conceal their identity. And that's how you determine what the truth is. You let the people determine Precisely. what the truth is based upon full disclosure all the way around. Exactly. Um, but we, we, don't, we don't have that right now. <laughs> no, perhaps not. It seems like we're, uh, you know, until we get some factual determinations from the Mueller report and Congress takes steps or prosecutors take steps. It's all speculation at this point. Exactly. So here we are. Uh, we've pretty much reached the end of our program. I'd like to take the opportunity here to let you share your final thought uh, and then how listeners can reach out to you and find on you on the web if you'd like. That would be great. I mean, I think where we were just ending up is, is a great place to end because my final thought is that this entire um, drama that's unfolding, I think, really underscores why it's so important to have campaign finance rules that have parameters about how people operate in the political realm and why disclosure of political spending on the internet and by corporations and groups spending money to influence how people vote is so important. And we'd like to see those rules strengthened and perhaps in, with the new Congress next year, that will happen. Great. And tell us about uh, the Center for Campaign Finance. Oh, great. So, yeah, at the Campaign Legal Center, uh, you can find us at www.campaignlegal.org. And, yeah, come visit us. Great. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. Thank you very much, Erin, for being on it. If you like what you heard today, please rate us in Apple Podcasts. You can also visit us at LegalTalkNetwork.com, where you can leave a comment on today's show and sign up for our newsletter. I'm Craig Williams. Thanks for listening. Join us next time for another great legal topic. Remember, when you want legal, think lawyer to lawyer. Thanks for listening to Lawyer to Lawyer, produced by the broadcast professionals at Legal Talk Network. Join J. Craig Williams and Robert Ambrosi for their next podcast, covering the latest legal topic. Subscribe to the RSS feed on LegalTalkNetwork.com or in iTunes. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.